tonight. Join us for a nostalgic look back at America's favorite 50s family, the Cunninghams. And the exciting adventures of the coolest guy in the history of television, the one and only, the Fonz. You'll relive the memorable friendships. Sit on it, posse. The sweet and tender romances. You want to dance first or go right out to the heavy stuff? You want a broken nose first or go right on to the hospital? And all the incredible barrel-leaping, bull-riding, shark-jumping action. Action. Shark. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. We'll show you some never-before-seen bloopers. Hi, Mom. Hi, Dad. Our favorite practical jokes. Henry Winkler's personal home movies. And for the first time on television, the Happy Days cast reunites for a 30th anniversary softball game. Those guys aren't athletes, they're actors. Plus, we'll all get together at Arnold's for a post-game celebration with some very special surprise guests. All this and more on the Happy Days 30th anniversary reunion. Monday, happy days. Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days. Thursday, Friday, happy days. Saturday, what a day. Rooting all week with you. These days are awesome. Happy days. These days are awesome. These happy days are yours and mine. These happy days are yours and mine. Happy days. Welcome to the Happy Days. 30th anniversary reunion. We are actually standing in front of the original Cunningham house. Oh, Tom, it's so hard to believe that we moved in 30 years ago. It sure is, Marion. We may have left this house, but it never left us. There's so many wonderful memories the cast has shared through the years. And since all of you were such a big part of the Happy Days family and our success, we would like to share these memories with you. Come on, Marion. Let's go share some of those incredible years, Oh, huh? Tom, they changed my favorite curtains. What do you think about his sex? Yeah, so do you. I know. Do you think maybe there's something wrong with us? Yeah. We decided we would do a nostalgic series about the 1950s and we would set it in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Tom Millis and Eddie Milkus were the producers, and Tom Millis said, if we do a TV series that takes place in another era, when it goes into reruns, it won't look old. It made a lot of sense to me. Reruns that look the same as the original. What a concept. I wasn't sure I wanted to be on another television series, because I'd been on The Andy Griffith Show from 1960 to 1968. But I like the script, I like the show, I like the part. It's pretty hard to be 16 and growing up. Maybe it was easier when my parents were young, but now it's the 1950s and the world's really getting complicated. Well, don't get me wrong, I have a great family. My father's in the hardware business, my mom does volunteer work for the Red Cross, and my brother goes to college, and my sister wants to go to an orthodontist. Today's a big day. We are going to be the first family on the block to get a television set. Anson was in it, Marion Ross was in it, and otherwise the cast was 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 different, different set of characters and a different tone. Actually, a little more inspired by a, a popular movie of the moment, which was Summer of '42. I bet you invite Arlene Nestruck over some night. She is stacked, but not very bright. You gonna kiss her mind? Who talks when they neck? You don't know anything. You looking for a knuckle sandwich? Watch it, I'll punch you out. Harold Gould was the husband. We had a different little girl. And the Fonzie character wasn't in it, the Ralphie character wasn't in it. Richard seems upset about something. Maybe you should go in and talk to him. Soon as this is over. <laughs> we did the show. I enjoyed doing it. It didn't sell. We thought it was great. They said, who cares, we don't like it. New family in town, boring. 50s, out. <laughs> never wasted anything in those days. The original Happy Days went on Love American Style. Love American Style, truer than the red, white, and blue. Love American Style, truer than the red, white, and blue. That's me and you. I, uh, I guess this is good night, then. Uh-huh. I had a nice time anyway. Who is it? Oh. 
It's okay, Ma. It's me. I'm with Richard. Stand over here, and I'll stand on the other side. I guess this is uh, good night now. <laughs> and that was the end of that. But if one waits long enough, ideas come around. George Lucas is making a movie called American Graffiti. They say Ron Howard could play 50s. Don't you have film on that? I say, yeah, I shot up the pilot. Ron Howard is playing in the 50s. George Lucas looked at the pilot, they hired Ron Howard. American Graffiti takes place in 1962, but it's really all about the end of the 50s. And American Graffiti was just an amazing surprise hit. It just played and played and played. A wonderful show on Broadway called Grease and suddenly the geniuses in television said, all these 50 things, don't we have one of these on the shelf? They said, Gary, where is that thing? And out I brought it, and they say, well, not quite good enough, but let's remake it. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock, rock, we're going to rock. Around the clock tonight, please, glad, glad, John. My friend lied to everybody about a girl. Oh, well, it's obvious that uh, the lie is bothering him and he ought to go back and tell the truth. To everybody? I mean, even Fonzie? What's a Fonzie? What Michael Eisner and Tom Miller wanted was uh, a gang, because there was a gang in American Graffiti. They wanted this mean gang. And I didn't have room for a gang, so I kind of said, I'll give you one guy who's a gang himself. Hey, have you seen Potsy around? Oh, great. Uh, thanks a lot. I'll see you, Fonzie. I made a promise to myself I would never comb my hair. I would never wear a garrison belt. I would never have, like, uh, cigarettes or anything in my sleeve. And I would never chew gum. Because every actor who played that kind of character did that. The director said to me, it says here, you got to go to the mirror and comb your hair. I said, oh, please, don't make me do that. Please, I, I made a promise that I would never comb my hair. He said, I, I'm so sorry, you, you've got to. And I thought, oh my Lord, what am I going to do? I resigned myself, I walked up to the mirror, I took out the comb and I went, whoa, I don't have to because it's perfect. And I was being true to myself and I was being respectful to what was written and the Fonz was born in that moment. Hey, baby, baby, ba -ba -ba -ba. No. That was me blowing in your ear. Richie was Ron. He really was Ron. We saw his first date, his first gambling experience, his first drinking experience. All we had was some beer and teeny weeny glasses. How many teeny weeny glasses did you have? 72. <laughs> I think it's time for some teeny weeny cups of coffee. It was my coming of age story. The irony was, in my life and in the lives of Donnie and Anson and, and Henry, we were, we were sort of undergoing that. How far did you get? All I'm saying is Mary Lou's a nice girl. You didn't get very far. Lay off, Potsy, will you? OK. In the early years of the show, Richie and Potsy were, were more the focus, and Fonzie and I were sort of peripheral characters. Doesn't look like a hickey. Of course it doesn't look like a hickey. You can't walk around with teeth marks on your neck. Suppose your old man sees him. Joni, in the in the beginning years, didn't have much. It was a bleep in and out, and uh, you know, smart aleck remarks. Here's your nickel. What's the secret? You got home at two o'clock last night. That's no secret. It is to dad. <laughs> You're cruising for a bruising kid. Oh yeah, you'd have to catch me first. Gary Marshall learned what we could do, and the writers wrote for us. <laughs> Richie. Don't you find it a little hard staring this way? Hey, we have nice seats. Isn't that great? Here we were getting a 70s look at a 50s family. What do you plan to do when you get out of school? Well, I was thinking I, I might become a cop. I mean, it's the only job I know where they pay you to drive a motorcycle. We thought we had come up with this great character called Fonzie. And what happened was the network suddenly said, we don't like this Fonzie character. Fonzie's a hood. Dear, I don't like to hear you talk like that. He drives a motorcycle, and motorcycle drivers are hoods. The network didn't want him in a leather jacket because that leather jacket implied all that tough world. So he was in a little gabardine windbreaker. 
It's a wonder they didn't have a bunch of little pencils there. So I wrote a letter to the network saying, here's what we'll do. Only when he rides the motorcycle, he'll have a leather jacket. Fonzie's not so bad. He's probably got a good heart underneath all that leather. Fonzie got his jacket back, and then I wrote another memo. Writers, never, ever in any scene let Fonzie be without his motorcycle. Kickstand me. Great, Fonzie. Kickstand me. Up, up. All right. How's that, Fonzie? The windbreaker that Fonzie wore, I threw in a dumpster on the Paramount lot. The leather jacket he wore is in the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, and that's absolutely true. The Happy Days 30th Anniversary Reunion returns with more great clips and a look at our hilarious blooper reel. The fun's just beginning. No milk and cookies if you wander off. Happy days are yours and mine. Happy days are yours and mine. Happy days. You know, Marion, Happy Days really was a big hit, but it took some adjustments to really make the show fly. You know, a big change was taping in front of a live audience. <laughs> Originally, the show was conceived as a single camera comedy. MASH was a single camera comedy. The Andy Griffith Show had been single camera comedy. I was very, very comfortable with that. We loved it because it was like making a movie and you can do a very subtle kind of acting in one camera. The show was not doing very well. So we were going to take one last chance, and that was doing it in front of a live audience. There was a certain challenge and excitement to doing it in front of an audience. Um, it's a little bit more like doing a play. Well, it scared the hell out of me. I didn't mind the idea. I, you know, I mean, I didn't protest the notion, but I'd never been in front of an audience. I'd never done anything in front of an audience. Tonight's Happy Days was filmed before a live audience. All right, now this Sunday, something very special is going to happen, and uh, some of you are going to be invited. Really, I wanted to throw up before the show. I was never so frightened in my life. Fonz, what's up? You, you a little nervous, huh? You want some advice? <laughs> it was just a joke. I didn't feel like I was in control of what I was doing. I, I wasn't relaxed at all. I was just kind of getting through it. This happens to be a list of the qualifications of a perfect wife. This is a biggie. Must be untried. Oh, right, untried. <laughs> Five. What's untried? <laughs> Dummy. It means she's never been in court. <laughs> it means that she's got to be pure. She's got to be a virgin. Virgin. <laughs> But get through it, I did, and it was exciting to hear those laughs. Don't get mad, but uh, how can you be sure about that? Well, the uh, number four. Yeah. yeah. About her being a virgin. Yeah. yeah. She told me. <laughs> Six. Well, couldn't she have lied? <laughs> Come in. Virgins don't lie. <laughs> Ron Howard was fantastic in front of a live audience. So they moved it inside onto stage 19, and we were now going to do it for 300 people Friday nights. It was intense, and we never looked back. Everybody gets scared. If you're going to survive in this world, you just can't show it all the time, that's all. Yeah, but you never get scared. I know, that's why I'm the fun. <laughs> I think that the show became a big hit, really, uh, when Henry's role was expanded. I guess one of the big episodes was when Fonzie, you know, jumped the barrels on his motorcycle. And what's so funny, if you think about it, it's beyond corny, but there was something so magical about Henry and his character. It just became the evil Knievel of his time. I mean, there's something, people wanted heroes and he was it. All right, hey, 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 I'm all right. She's my leg, I'm cool. I'm always cool. All right, fine! Right, go, fine. Right, let's take him inside. Fonzo started doing things that nobody could do. Snap his fingers and 
the world would stop or whatever. Snap knows no age limit. Fonzie became a full-blown character, and the live audiences at Happy Days cheered when he just walked on. He didn't say anything yet. He got powers. He would hit the jukebox, the music would come on, or he'd hit it and would go off. One, two, three o'clock, four o'clock, rock. Anyone would say, oh my God, come on. Well, not, no, no, no. Not, not with Happy Days and not with the Fonz, it worked. I was in the alleyway with Richie and I hit the side of a building. <laughs> <laughs> you, you just, the, the whole building was like, you just, <laughs> how, how did you do that? It's a gift. <laughs> and then being in the forest and not being able to sleep because all the animals were making noise and chattering with each other. Cool it! And the entire forest, silent, for the fawns to go to sleep. Let's see Tarzan do that. It doesn't get much cooler than that. Introducing the man who is fighting the never-ending battle for truth! Justice and the American way, the Fonz! Fonzi soon became a national hero, and so the uh, National Library Association said, could you get kids to read a little more? They won't read. Before I knew what was happening, Fonz. before I knew what was happening, I was applying for my own library card and checking out my very first book. Well, he discovered that. How cool is this? Anybody can get a library card and go in and and get a book. You went to the library all those years and, and you never got a card? No, I never thought they'd give it to a guy like me, but do you know there's a card for everybody? <laughs> That's right, everybody is allowed to read. Registration for library cards went up 500% in America because the font said that one line. I tell you, the font's his work is never done. <laughs> Just the power of a man on a TV set is pretty strong if you got the right character and the right actor. Coming up, Henry Winkler's personal home movies, our favorite bloopers and practical jokes, plus the cast reunites at Arnold's when the Happy Days 30th anniversary reunion can... I saw this movie, Bugsy Malone, and I said, I like that little one. He was like 10. I said, he's going to be a sexy kid, that one. Gary said, do you want to be on Happy Days? I think it was the biggest show on television at the time. I don't even know what the heck they wanted me on the show for. And I, you know, what do you, no. <laughs> Scott Baio was amazing because he came on and became this incredible psychic. I want you to have this. An old mechanic chat? Don't you make fun of a historical monument. <laughs> this is my first hat. Oh, your first hat? Can I keep it? Yeah. It's the best, because here he was the same age. Um, I had someone that I could relate to. Chachi, oh, we have a nice little souvenir for you. Joni. Oh, Joni, just what I always wanted. I <laughs> not me score this. He became the younger version of Richie, and Fonzie could give him advice and then give Richie advice. But school's a drag. Hey, let me tell you something. You trust me. School is cool. You say so. I say so. Scott became a huge heartthrob for teenage girls and sort of a younger version of Fonzie. It was like, you know, the second coming. <laughs> yeah. Two girls? Yeah, two to one. I love the odds. <laughs> Somebody said, let's do a show with these two kids singing. And again, I said, I don't sing. Please don't do that to me. That's what they did. Push it, get a baby now. Push it, get a baby. Scott started off as Fonzie's cousin and built into the new teen sensation of the show. Took over the spot. Boy, did he take over the spot. He's getting bigger than life, and the girls are going nuts. I mean, it was very Beatlesque in my mind, which is a really cool thing. So my experience was, was great. I mean, it was, uh, it couldn't have been better. Fonzie, sit on it. 
poner. I said we need some catchphrases. E. He said, yes, the writers, and they sent me a list every week. And I said, sit on it's not bad, let's try that. Oh, sit on it, Potsy. Sit on it, Howard. Sit on it, Potsy. Hey! Oh, Howard, what am I gonna do with this? <laughs> Knit on it, Marion. Gary got the idea that we could have other catchphrases. Well, I'll tell you something, buckos. <laughs> 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 Got it. I was the first one to say nerd on TV. Gee, Patsy, uh, you should act this nice all the time. Then people wouldn't think you're such a nerd. You call me a nerd. I have known you all these years, Fonz. You have never, ever called me that. But, Joni, he's a nerd. I'll take credit. I, the one thing I did come up with was Mr. and Mrs. C. Hi, Mr. C. Mr. C, this is the best dinner I've ever had. Goodbye, Mr. C, Mr. C. Hey, Mr. C. Hey, Mr. C. We used to think this is getting a little ridiculous. Now they're just reaching for, you know, anything they can find and just trying to force it into being, becoming a catchphrase. Yowza, yowza, yowza. He's such a hunk. Cheerleaders. Wah, wah, wah. It came from <laughs> what, what, what. And I would go, wah, wah, what? That's where it came from. Me and Blue Eyes, wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, wah, wah. I am not going to leave wah, wah, wah and Blue Eyes alone. We tried this great gimmick after a while where we put a bandana around Scott Bayo's leg so everybody would copy that. Well, we looked and nobody seemed to be copying it. But to this day, I meet kids who say, I had to put that stupid red bandana on my leg because you put that in the show. There are lots more Happy Days memories, bloopers, and clips ahead, so don't go away. And children, don't sit too close to the TV. You'll damage your eyes. These happy days are your... Ah, where'd you get him? A car. A car is not a window to knowledge. <laughs> Fonzie dated so many girls, I thought it was time he should have a girlfriend. And my family and I were driving to Palm Springs and we had a flat tire. And I sat there and I literally looked up and the sign said, a Tuscadero. And I said, that could be it, Pinky Tuscadero. Hey, Fonz! Guess who? Hiya, Pinky. Mm -hmm. Long time. Yeah, a little too long. Uh-huh. How you been? Well, not a hair out of place. Was there ever? If Fonzie's going A, then Pinky's got to do something else. Later. Susie Quattro is a rock and roll singer that played Leather Tuscadero. Pinky Tuscadero's sister. Hey, gang! She sang a couple of songs in, in some of the episodes, and she made a uh, real strong impression. Oh, My favorite episodes was dancing the uh, tango with the Fonz. We had a dance contest. Howard wouldn't go with me, so the Fonz did. Hey! My favorite episode of all time is the one where Ron, Anson, and Donnie go to the mountains and they tell these women that they're Tunisian camel jockeys. What do you and your friends do in Tunisia? Jockeys. Mock, mock. Yes, we, we, we race camels, we jockeys, yes. Uh, huff, huff, yes. And it's maybe one of the funniest television episodes of any show ever. Marsha, Linda, and I yeah. were wondering if you guys would like to uh, make out. <laughs> I guess they don't understand. Oh, understand. Oh, yes. Mark, 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 Mark. He's so cute. Mark, 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 Mark. In New York, growing up, I taught myself the Kazatsky, and I mentioned that to the writers at one time, and they wrote it in.
Gary Marshall is unabashedly, uh, unequivocally a genius. That's just it. Gary had a way of picking unbelievably talented people to surround himself with, and he being maybe the most talented. He was just so clever and so energizing. Because of Gary Marshall's inspiration, I've been involved in a lot of different entrepreneurial ventures. I was able to create a music career, get behind the camera as a director, even retail now with Star Maker products. We get these fantastic products used on Hollywood sets to everybody. I owe it all to Gary Marshall and Happy Days. It's Gary is a natural teacher. He knew from the beginning my dream was to be a filmmaker. And he was supportive of the idea, as was everyone. Happy Days was a tremendous learning experience for me. Um, no, no question. I'm gonna teach you the secret of being tough. Wow, you don't think I could ever hey, learn? Hey, who told you to talk? I'm sorry, Fonz. <laughs> That's the secret. People talk to me today in the year 2005 about Happy Days. They watched with their grandmother, they watched with their children. They grew up on it, they learned English from it. Would you just say goodbye in another language? Oh, sure. Adios, amigos. <laughs> When it came out, the people who'd been raised in the 50s now had kids who were 10 to 15 years old. And it became one of the things people looked forward to was Tuesday night, we're all gonna watch the show. And it's kept it going in reruns. Do you live at home? No, I'm in the dorms. What about you? Oh, oh, I, uh, I live in a house. Oh, uh, it's by Delta? No. Alpha, Tom, Omega? No, uh, mama, papa, sister. <laughs> The show was loved around the world because of, of something that went beyond the words. Even through the humor, there was heart. I think that's one of the reasons the show has proven to be so timeless, is because it was, you know, well, it was timeless when we made it. When we return, the fun continues. I took home movies um, of every aspect of, of the show over the 11 years because I just never wanted to forget who was around and what we did and what it looked like and what it felt like. Action! Anyone who came on the set was welcome. There was no egos, there was no, no pressure. So it was very nice, very easy. A lot of fun, always a good time. Good place to be. The show could not have been as successful as it was without each person being great at what they did. It was a team effort. And Gary thought it was really important that the family that works together should play together. Let's talk baseball. So he started the softball team. Television and showbiz has a lot of stress. So you got to get distractions. And softball was a great distraction. We had some great athletes on our softball team. Except Henry. Henry never played softball. I've never played ball in my life. I have no eye-hand coordination, so I couldn't hit. I couldn't catch, for sure. Certainly, I didn't know what pitching was. Ron Howard bought me a mitt. Anson bought me a bat. And they taught me to pitch on the soundstage 19 on Paramount Lot. And I became the pitcher for the Happy Days ball team. And now here's our pitcher, Henry. Wakeler, the Fonz. We would go to two or three major league parks a year, and we'd have these road trips, and they were just thrilling. And I get emotional thinking about it. It was just one of the great experiences of my life, these road trips we'd go on. Okay, we're gonna go to the hotel now, and we'll have time to change into our uniforms, and at 4.45, the bus will pick us up at the hotel. We have a new member of the cast that'll join us for the first time in a little baseball gig, Kathy Silver, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Those games were fantastic. I mean, we'd played in front of 40,000 people at Shea Stadium. And that's, you know, to play softball, to play baseball without a backstop behind you, it's cool stuff. 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a fun day here at Shea. We are delighted that the Happy Days crowd has flown from California with their softball team. Marion Ross became a very good player. She got a hit one game. I sent her flowers. She did 11 years of acting. I never sent her anything. But she got one hit in the softball game. I sent her flowers. To Marion Beerfight Ross. By getting on base and allowing a pinch runner, you once again started a run, scoring rally that won the game. You're the ball player's ball player. We played in about six, seven different stadiums, and that was like a dream come true for me and Ron, because, I mean, I was a huge baseball fan. Before the game, I'm out in the outfield shagging flies with the, some of the real ball players doing batting practice. That was it for me. You couldn't beat that. We'd go into these cities and be treated like kings. It was just incredible. And then the USO called, and we went to Germany. Germany. And flew all over Germany and met the troops wherever they were. It was great. It was really, really fun. Geez, you, hey, it's not so hard. I can't get it on. <laughs> Wonderful experiences. We'd get in big Black Hawk helicopters and travel from base to base. We went to the East German border and played with the 3rd Infantry. We beat them. <laughs> you know, I don't know. We were over there trying to boost morale, but uh, we kicked a little ass. We're winning, and it's exciting to come all the way and win the first game, huh? When we were in Okinawa, we beat the Marines, we beat the Navy, we beat the Army, beat the Air Force, and the Marines were so upset, they wanted another game, and they flew in ringers from Tokyo, and we beat them worse. Nine to three, Henry Winkler pitched like a banshee. It was very serious, and it was about winning, just like the real teams. And if Aaron didn't catch that fly, get her out of here, get right her out of it. <laughs> and that happened. It became a real bonding. I remember we played in this league, a show league, where you'd have double headers you know, every Sunday. And God, I just so look forward to that. I miss it to this day as I'm talking about it.